Hello, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here at the uh, CAOCS uh, 2011 conference. I'd really like to uh, thank the conference organizers. who have done a fantastic job in uh, pulling this whole thing together, uh, uh, just showing a, a really uh, good job of uh, how, um, how how great Edmonton could be as a, a city for having one of these events, and uh, we really appreciate uh, all your um, all, all your um, efforts on our behalf uh, for this uh, conference. Uh, today I'd like to present to the work of, uh, of our group. We do a lot of uh, work with uh, small molecules that are associated with uh, oil fractions of lipid-soluble compounds. And uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the title as we go through, but um, one of the things that we've been uh, identifying is, is that uh, we've been looking at biorefining but by refining of uh, oil seeds, and we find that uh, very often when we look at the economic model, it turns out that uh, uh, small compounds often make a huge difference in the in the value proposition. So the the ability to uh, take the uh, by refinery to a future um, opportunity requires that uh, that we take advantage of the small things that are present uh, when we're processing. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, must be recognized, so first of all, we're from the University of Saskatchewan, but we also have a, a significant research group studying lipid quality and utilization. This is uh, what we call Team Fat. Uh, we have a web page, uh, it's, uh, it's teamfat.usas.ca, and uh, this is just showing the members of Team Fat, uh, both uh, postdocs, uh, um, research associates, graduate students, technicians, uh, um, you know, quite a large array of people, and I'll be talking about who specifically has contributed the work over time, and we have got a, quite a prodigious group, and I'd like to uh, really highlight their research. Now, driving into town uh, yesterday, we had a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to witness uh, uh, refineries. If you uh, look at the uh, east side of uh, Edmonton, uh, we have what was called a refinery row. This is the Strathcona refinery, and we can uh, see this uh, as a very interesting future guide to where we're going with biorefineries. The, this refinery is uh, taking in crude oil, a single um, but very complex product, and processing it into everything from uh, asphalt all the way up to uh, um, uh, 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 liquid natural gas. And uh, so, what we're looking at is uh, is the uh, potential of, of taking a, a material, making higher value of products like lubricants, as well as bulk materials, commodity materials like uh, gasoline and diesel fuel. And uh, just to get uh, back the title, uh, the, uh, the when I was saying that I was wanting to talk about the advantage and, and the opportunity in small things, um, one of the things that this is a quote from uh, um, uh, an author, uh, fairly well known, um, Mark Twain, and uh, what he, uh, he he cited was that many small things have been made large by the right kind of advertising, and this is the. This is something that we have to think about when we're biorefinery processing is we're going to take advantage of small things and they will become large within the whole process. But uh, we also uh, will need to uh, communicate that to uh, those that, uh, that, that uh, are interested in this process as well. Now, when I go through this talk, we're going to uh, um, talk, first of all, definitions, what we mean by biorefinery. Uh, why it's important, and then uh, I'm going to talk about specific applications, things that we've been researching in our group. Uh, this will include uh, looking at the opportunity of uh, taking advantage of co-products, first of the first uh, generation of ethanol production, and specifically of thin stillage. Now, when we look at this, uh, first generation ethanol is going to be with us for quite a long time, and so we, we feel that uh, uh, making advances in this area is good. And interestingly, because the yeast and, and the conversion systems that are used in first-generation ethanol are likely to be similar to those of the second generation and further generations, we believe that uh, gains we make now will be applicable to future generations. We'll also talk about first-generation biodiesel, and I can make the same sort of comment that uh, we expect that uh, for between uh, first and further generations, we'll still find the, uh, the um, advantage of, uh, you know, the advantages hold. And in this case, the, uh, the material where it's a small material but has the potential to be made large through processing is unsupponable fraction. And I'm going to talk about some uh, specific materials within flax oil as well that present an opportunity for biorefinery. So 
a biorefinery. It's a facility that integrates biomass conversion processes and equipment to produce a wide range of material, everything, food, fuel, power, heat, value-added uh, chemicals, etc., for biomass. So there's a large number of materials that can be obtained from, uh, from these uh, resources. Uh, traditionally, uh, and and uh, recently, people have uh, you know start out with was food, feed, and fiber, um, fuel. It was uh, was added more recently. These are the biorefinery um, product materials. So there's uh, um, there there's uh, most of the materials that we'd be producing would fall as to one of these uh, four Fs as food, feed, fiber, and fuel. However, a biorefinery facility um, could also and focus quite strongly on the production of value-added chemicals, things that are useful in our daily lives, and, uh, and I'd like to emphasize that as well. So ultimately the fifth F I'd like to have added to the list is food, feed, fiber, fuel, and fine chemicals. So the problem with uh, many biorefinery con concepts is that, um, that we're always linked to a, uh, a large and uh, much needed commodity, uh, something like fuel or food, and many of these uh, commodity prices are linked. So if the price of food goes up, or the price of fuel goes up, the price of food goes up. And uh, some of the things that happen as a result of this can uh, can be quite uh, difficult in terms of uh, maintaining the, uh, the the continuity of research if if uh, political. Um, uh, influences uh, come to rise. So bio, uh, bioenergy production has uh, had bad press um, as a result of the rise of commodity prices. I'll give you an example. As you can see from this uh, unfortunate image, uh, we have a competition um, you know, occurring between uh, somebody who's the, uh, the biofuel USA uh, asking for fuel for his uh, large vehicle from Mother Nature, and uh, meanwhile, caught in the shade underneath is a is a, a poor, starving uh, individual who has uh, who is also looking for food from Mother Nature and cannot get uh, access to this material. Um, this is very much a re misrepresentation of, of reality, but it uh, it uh, does uh, play well with uh, those people who don't do not know what's going on uh, with the actual flow and distribution of food. What um, uh, is often cited, for example, as an example is 25, 30, 40 percent of the corn crop of the United States is going into the production of uh, biofuel. And uh, when that statement is, is made, it sounds awful. It sounds like we're, uh, we're depriving the world of that output from the United States. But in fact, if you look at it more closely, that, that material probably would never have been grown if it weren't for the biofuel industry. So we're looking at uh, the potential of uh, actually producing more food and more uh, as, as the biofuel production is uh, as uh, continued. And in addition to this, uh, some significant work has been done. Um, this is a, a, a citation of a policy paper uh, by Baths and Haniotis. And uh, this is done uh, uh, under the auspices of the World Bank, and what they uh, did was a, a study of the commodity price boom that happened in 2006 to 2008 when all commodities, including fuel, uh, fertilizer, biofuels, etc., all went up in, uh, uh, in price simultaneously. And this uh, policy research working paper was, um, was quite uh, uh, useful in, in showing that, uh, that it was not biofuel, that uh, was resulting in this uh, opportunity or this uh, sudden rise in commodity prices. So, now that we've established this, a biorefinery could produce a wide range of fine chemicals, and uh, and, and I want to focus on that for the next uh, period, if uh, possible. In fact, I'm betting uh, this, you know, and a significant part of the research that I do, I'm, I'm saying that uh, biorefineries of the future will generate uh, the commodities that we've been talking about. But high-value co-products and, and fine chemicals that will also come out as a result of this will, will add to the economic uh, value of it. But food, food is going to be a major product of biorefineries. It is now. If you look at the uh, first gray, uh, generation of ethanol and biodiesel production, they produce huge amounts of food and we rely on them and in the future that will also occur. 
Uh, we've uh, established at the uh, University of Saskatchewan uh, the uh, bioprocessing pilot plant. And uh, this, uh, these images are taken from the pilot plant. Here you can see uh, some of our uh, more advanced uh, graduate students. I believe the one with a smile on his face in the front is working on his PhD. And uh, this is, uh, these are examples of, of the work we're doing at the bioprocessing pilot plant. So um, trying to give you a little bit of an idea as to, as to how we're proceeding and what sort of work we've been doing uh, there, we're trying to use this equipment to uh, is, uh, generate real-life uh, processes and, uh, that can be uh, scaled up for industrial processing. So we have a lot of different equipment uh, present in that uh, pilot plant. Uh, the bioprocessing pilot plant, for example, has a lot of things for working with uh, fluid products and uh, solid products. We have the means of separating solid and liquid uh, materials. We have reactors that will go up to uh, 300 degrees centigrade and 600 pounds per square inch. Uh, this is enough to uh, do, for example, uh, subcritical water extractions, etc. Um, we have uh, evaporation, and this is uh, a large part, part of... Um, uh, chemistry and uh, and industrial chemistry is the ability to evaporate water with the uh, different conditions. So we have uh, rotary evaporators which will achieve flash evaporation, thin film distillation uh, uh, used for uh, uh, materials that can't stand heating over a length of time, spray drying again for uh, drying materials in a, in a very rapid manner, and uh, removing water from them, freeze drying as well for those uh, materials that can stand either oxygen or oxidizing conditions. And, um, and temperature. In addition to the bioprocessing pilot plant, we have liquid-liquid um, uh, separation uh, techniques like the car column, flash chromatography uh, equipment as well, simulated moving bed chromatography, and we have one of the most advanced uh, simulated moving bed devices available, and spinning band distillation. If you look at this image, um, the when we have uh, originally had the um, uh, simulated moving bed uh, device. You can see the uh, device is actually um, wrapped in aluminum foil. This aluminum foil, uh, we had to do it because it had to hide the configuration of the columns. The columns were, were uh, a, a, uh, an object of intellectual property, the, the way that they were arranged and held, and, and the patent had to be filed to uh, protect that, and they uh, did not want uh, that uh, arrangement uh, shown on the, on the, our web page or any pictures that we might release. Now, uh, this is about uh, eight months ago now, uh, they are, we're, the patent has been filed and we can show the column arrangement. Um, biorefinery opportunities arise from the first generation of ethanol production, as I said earlier, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. First, a little bit of uh, background information. The need for bioproducts uh, is massive. If you're talking about uh, making ethanol in, uh, ethanol biofuels, there's a huge amount of ethanol used, uh, needed, and, and there is a huge amount being produced. And so we're looking at the uh, production of ethanol um, of about 80 billion liters a year. And that's, that was as of uh, 2010. And those numbers have continued to climb as well. Now, one of the things that happens, if uh, just as I've said, the um, uh, the ethanol production is huge. The 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 next the corollary of that is is that if there are co-products and you're producing a huge amount of, of the main product, the that that material, the biorefinery co-product and its production is going to be massive, just as as the other uh, material is massive. So I'm going to give you an an example of that if we can go forward. So if you look at this uh, current example, this is just a, a diagram of uh, the fermentation, a very simple fermentation of a um, carbohydrate to produce um, yeast, uh, you know, with yeast to do, and uh, fermenting sugar to produce ethanol. And uh, if you look at the uh, diagram, what we're, what we're doing is we're generating a, a recycled system. We uh, recycle the yeast and, uh, and keep the fermentation going with, uh, um, with the system. And uh, we also heat the material, drive off ethanol in the, in the distillation uh, device. And we have a res residual material we, uh, you know, after the, all the alcohol stripped out of it. And you see it says a concentrated stillage. That, that's the liquid uh, or the thin stillage that we're talking about. It's a liquid solution, and it's readily sub uh, separated from the whole stillage uh, by some simple screens and, uh, and, and separation of solids that way. Now, typically when you uh, ferment, as I've just shown you in the previous diagram, the organisms will produce up to 20% ethanol, but no higher. 
So what happens is that uh, if, if the, uh, the total alcohol concentration is, um, you know, um, arrives at 20%, uh, that means that you have four times the volume of stillage as, as that of ethanol. So you're, you're, you're talking a, a huge amount of, uh, of materials. And if you remember that I stated before that there was 80 billion liters of ethanol being produced, four times 80 is 320 billion liters of, of then stillage. So that's just a very large number. And anything that's dissolved in there would be a potentially uh, a valuable ma raw material for producing future products. So the literature suggests that thin stillage contains a number of compounds. These compounds come from yeast. They're the yeast metabolites. They're bacterial metabolites. They're soluble molecules remaining in the organic matter introduced uh, uh, to the fermentation. So there's a number of uh, materials that are accumulating in this stillage. We took this uh, stillage product, and we've uh, been doing a, a number of studies. This has been done primarily by a student, uh, Consuli Rotana Pariano. And, uh, and uh, what she um, did was took the uh, stillage and did a proton NMR spectra of 500 megahertz, and she suppressed the water signal using a, uh, a suppression pulse. And if you look at this uh, spectrum, you can see now that there's uh, all the organic compounds that are present, and a number of these are quite useful compounds. You'll see that we have a phenethyl alcohol, which is a potentially antimicrobial compound. And the next one over shows a compound called glycerol phosphorylcholine, or GPC. That's a potential um, anti-Alzheimer's drug. Betaine uh, is, is, a, is a nutrient. Um, succinic acid is a potential chemical starting material. Acetic acid is uh, used widely in foods. 1,3-propane uh, diol is used uh, potentially in plastics as a replacement for antifreeze. Lactic acid is used in uh, producing uh, plastics, polylactates, etc. And isopropanol is uh, present in this material as well. Now, based on, uh, uh, on um, uh, uh, Cornsulli's uh, uh, information in her, uh, in her thesis, which was uh, in her master's thesis in 2011, um, we can see that the, uh, the grams per liter content of these things is, tends to be quite low. Uh, lactic acid, for example, one of the more abundant materials is 5 grams per liter. That's about a half a percent. Glycerol is 5.85 uh, uh, grams per liter, again, around a half a percent. All totaled, uh, the, the carbohydrates and, and related organic compounds in here amount to about uh, 3 per, uh, percent of the uh, dry matter of the, um, of the stillage. But as you recall, we had 320 billion liters potential of this in the worldwide uh, stillage production. So these numbers, uh, you know, half a percent out of 320 billion liters, results in millions of tons of, uh, uh, of product. For example, glycerol would be 1.9 uh, uh, million tons. This is uh, more than the uh, glycerol produced in biodiesel production. And the lactic acid similarly is, is a very uh, sizable amount. So we're looking at um, we're looking at a, a very substantial amount of material being produced as a result of biodiesel production or of ethanol production. So what we're saying is is that first generation ethanol and sub subsequently also the second generation ethanol production will eventually provide all manner of feed additives, industrial fluids lubricants and antifreeze, plastics and polymers. These materials will be drawn from to power industry through the use of uh, biorefinery techniques to, to extract them and use them in the future. And uh, as well, we will uh, look and add to that list uh, a number of fine chemicals which we will also be obtaining from this uh, process. Uh, one, one notable example is uh, glycerol phosphorylcholine. As I said, it's been used as a drug for improving um, intellectual performance, um, cognitive performance, and slowing the onset of Alzheimer's disease has also shown an impact on strokes as well. Uh, interesting, anytime you ferment uh, this much material, you also see uh, bacterial metabolites. Um, we expect as a large uh, um, co-product, this is going to be cobalamin or vitamin B12. Um, and we also expect to see antimicrobial compounds coming from the bacteria, such as bacteriosins um, and uh, other polypeptides and dextrins, which may have uh, other applications as well. And this particular uh, thing, I'd just like to tell you that um, Corin Suli is presenting a paper uh, showing her recent work on the fermentation of uh, stillage. What she's uh, describing in this, uh, in this uh, poster uh, that she has here 
is the, uh, the, the, the fact that we've got specific bacterial isolates that uh, selectively convert the glycerol in the stillage to 1,3-propanediol. So if you, uh, if you uh, want to uh, understand more in depth about uh, this particular topic, you can go and visit our poster when, uh, uh, when the session is on. So, just as I had j discussed a specific uh, um, opportunity from the ethanol industry, uh, we also have been working on uh, biorefinery opportunities arising from first-generation biodiesel production. Um, the recovery of unspawnifiable materials uh, from the biodiesel production becomes a real opportunity when you, uh, when, when you convert it, because if you uh, look at the reaction for production of biodiesel, it reduces the molecular weight, to, and it's all part of reducing the viscosity of the material so it can be used as a fuel. Um, what, we, uh, what we've found is, is that uh, it becomes uh, readily possible to isolate uh, um, uh, unsaponified materials in bulk from uh, biodiesel production. It's also possible to uh, recover the meal that's left over and make protein isolates as well. So, from uh, biodiesel production, uh, if we look at the unsaponifiable fraction, it'll be rich in uh, phytosterols. So if you uh, look at the diagram here, uh, we're looking at a number of uh, common sterols, and you can see cytosterol, which would be the common uh, plant sterol, and cholesterol, which would be the, uh, the uh, sterol uh, that, that we are often worried about, uh, whether it accumulates in our blood uh, and, uh, and might arise in the uh, um, specific disease processes. So um, what we're going to talk about is cytosterol and related plant phytosterols. These have a potential benefit when they're used in the in the diet as, as a means of lowering uh, blood cholesterol. So if you can eat enough uh, cytosterol, uh, the uh, potential is, is that that will uh, lower your blood cholesterol as well. What we found uh, when we look at uh, different seeds such as uh, um, of, of the crucifer uh, Cruciferae, um, we have um, Brassica napis, uh, Brassica juncea, Brassica rapa, Sinapis alba, Brassica carinata. And what we've done is we've measured the total level of uh, phytosterols in each of, these, um, in each of these plants and plant species. The interesting thing is, is that uh, the phytosterol levels is, uh, is highest in Sinapis alba. In some lines of Sinapis alba, the, the um, phytosterol level is significantly higher than that that is found in corn. So even though it was mentioned earlier in the conference that uh, corn has the highest level of phytosterol, it's actually Sinapis alba oil would have the highest level of, uh, of uh, phytosterols. If you look at some of the uh, Sinapis alba lines that we're looking at, uh, they have a uh, 5% uh, total phytosterol ester. Uh, these lines uh, that we, we've uh, examined also have over 75% oleic acid. So if you were just take 15 mil serving of this uh, oil, Sinapis alba oil, high oleic type, uh, 0.7 grams of phytosterol ester could, uh, could be yielded out of, uh, out of 15 mils. That's fairly compar comparable to the levels of phytostanol esters that have been studied. So uh, they've been looking at feeding people phytostanol esters, 2 uh, times 0.85 grams daily, and shown uh, clinical lowering of uh, cholesterol levels. So it's possible that... Uh, um, consuming high oleic phytosterol in the form of uh, um, Sinapis alba oil would lower cholesterol. The bottom line uh, from this is that a crop, uh, such as a biodiesel crop, could yield a cholesterol-lowering food, uh, which would be a um, high oleic oil containing high levels of uh, phytosterol, but we also would have the opportunity to obtain bioenergy from this crop. Uh, the unique chemistry that uh, that is offered by this uh, crop is uh, is is emblemic em emblemic it is, is significant of the fact that uh, that we can do this with other crops as well. So we, we may find that it's uh, it becomes important in the future of our refinery to actually grow different species that have different uh, chemistry, so that we can take advantage of each of their chemistries individually. We're going to talk for a while now and uh, change gears from the oil side of oil seeds and talk now about protein concentrates. Uh, what we uh, um, did was we uh, investigated um, um, you know, the opportunities within the Canadian and the section, and we thought that meal utilization is a, is a, is a problem that faced with the oil seeds in Canada, and hopefully that uh, soy protein utilization may be a model for uh, the utilization of brassicaceous species. 
Now, one uh, route of adding value is to make protein concentrates protein isolates. Uh, protein isolation or concentration requires that the protein actually is dissolved at some point, and one of the, the, the major costs of this is uh, you know, utilizing and bringing in large amounts of water and, and uh, getting it ready for actually making the concentrates. We found that the stillage water left over from the ethanol industry <clears throat> is a suitable water for making uh, protein isolates. Basically, uh, when we look at the protein concentrate uh, stoichiometry, we'll take uh, warm stillage water, about eight parts, and mix that with uh, mustard or canola meal, about one part. And uh, with the appropriate adjustment of pH and salt, we can uh, extract uh, up to 60% of the protein. So this is just showing a response surface uh, where the, uh, the protein and uh, uh, the, the salt and uh, pH are altered and uh, showing the impact on protein concentration. So when we look at this uh, isolate, um, and this is not, not novel except for the fact that it was produced much less expensively, is the amino acid composition of the isolate is almost perfectly balanced. In addition, we've had a huge impact on the bottom line of, of both the ethanol industry and the uh, protein uh, recovery industry. Um, the life cycle assessment, this is the amount of energy that is required in the whole industry for ethanol production and protein extraction are greatly improved. And this is improvements caused by the integration of two processes. This is an integration of the biorefinery of an ethanol plant and potentially a biodiesel plant. And you can get uh, um, significant cost reductions and efficiencies by uh, thinking um, outside the box and producing proteins uh, for these uh, types of materials. And we're looking at cost-effective production of proteins for future applications. Um, just to show you some of the work that's uh, being done by uh, different uh, members of our group, um, particularly on the biorefinery associated with uh, oil seed processing and oils. Uh, this particular poster is uh, presented by uh, Felicia Gock, and it shows uh, her uh, work on uh, the discovery of, of novel catalysts for biodiesel production. These uh, catalysts are made from inexpensive glycerol that uh, can be obtained from a uh, uh, a biodiesel reaction, and uh, you can see in the center of the poster uh, new crystalline structures of, uh, of catalysts that uh, can be used for production of biodiesel. And they're also made from uh, materials like glycerol uh, and, and, and other simple sugars. And these catalysts are uh, potentially valuable for food applications as they don't require other uh, materials. I also like to uh, highlight uh, some, some other work. Uh, this is uh, presented um, earlier this afternoon by um, um, Michelle Nier. And um, if you uh, look at uh, her, uh, her work, um, what she's uh, been doing is synthesizing new uh, biolubricants uh, for the use, use in industry, possibly for lubricating car engines, as you can see here, possibly producing a motor oil. If we make motor oil from vegetable oil, one of the problems is that doesn't stay liquid and at very um, um, very low temperatures. And what we're trying to achieve is, is uh, uh, producing liquid, uh, uh, lipids that stay liquid at very low temperatures, such as minus 50 degrees. If we uh, just look at the oil structure of a typical triglyceride, uh, this contains um, um, monounsaturates like erisic acid, uh, oleic acid, and also saturated fatty acids. But this particular structure has um, relatively poor oxidative stability and poor low temperature flow properties. Michelle goes on to uh, show how she's able to study this uh, very specific material. This is a, a medium erisic acid rapeseed uh, echo. Uh, it's a brassica rapa. And, um, Brassica rapa has a very uh, um, excellent low temperature flow. As a matter of fact, we found that it has the best low temperature flow of any oil we've identified. And um, the uh, echo plant, uh, we, this uh, shows you that uh, a plant breeder can be your, uh, your, your best uh, friend. And uh, we uh, are showing here that uh, we have access to uh, large amounts of uh, uh, selections of echo. We're able to sort from the echo um, both uh, very low temperature flow, very uh, high linolenic acid types, and, uh, and also uh, uh, and, uh, materials with uh, different levels of oxidative stability. Michelle has presented that in, in her talk uh, um, here. 
So uh, she was able to uh, um, use a low-cost ca catalyst and produce a uh, biolubricant and, uh, and do this all very cost-effectively. And uh, in addition to this, there's other um, opportunities for biorefinery. For example, uh, in the uh, fish oil industry, uh, we have the opportunity to have um, uh, De Yun Yuan, who's come uh, to us from um, uh, Guangzhou, uh, from Jinan University, and uh, she did some work on the uh, recovery of fish daring. Fish daring is left over after the uh, concentration of DHA and EPA from uh, fish oil so that the uh, DHA and EPA can be used in capsules and for health foods, etc. And the fish staring itself is that leftover material that, uh, that has uh, the um, less than desirable effects. It's, a, it's a, um, essentially a high melting um, uh, material, but it is uh, quite suitable in the uh, environment around uh, Guangzhou for uh, use in motor oils and other such products. So she's investigated similar types of reactions to those that uh, Michelle has investigated this time using fish dairy. Now I'm going to uh, switch and we've been talking about both the ethanol and uh, other other industry. If you think about it, flax is also one of these crops that has been used widely and uh, it's uh, used for industrial purposes. So when we grow flax, largely we grow it to make uh, uh, paints and uh, and uh, fiber for uh, for different purposes. Uh, the fiber may be used for linen, the, um, the, the liquid oils are used for paints and pr wood preservatives, etc. Um, this puts it in the same type of uh, applications as you would find for ethanol and biodiesel, and uh, th this is not uh, unusual to think about flax in the same light. More recently, um, flax use uh, has been uh, tied to uh, the presence of, of uh, valuable materials, including um, uh, cyclic peptides, uh, gums that uh, you know that provide fiber for uh, digestion, lignans which are um, uh, phytoestrogenic and uh, have potential for health and uh, certain effects. Alpha linolenic acid is an anti-inflammatory source of omega-3 fatty acids, and it also uh, it's a rich source of fiber as well. What uh, what we're looking at, uh, for example, cyclobalamin peptides, uh, we've been doing a considerable amount of work, and you'll see a, a number of posters and presentations uh, here at this meeting. Uh, we're looking at these oil-soluble peptides. There, uh, I know this is an oil meeting, and uh, we, we we're just uh, finding these uh, small things uh, dissolved in the vegetable oil. Now, the uh, the the CLPs are uh, are um, occurring at. Uh, at a fairly appreciable level of the flaxseed mass, um, and uh, they are essentially a, a, a loop, a donut, a, a circular molecule, um, where the uh, amino and carboxyl termi terminus of the uh, peptide is closed. This makes them unusually chemically stable. For example, cyclone peptide A, uh, we found, is resistant to heating to 200 degrees centigrade. Um, so that's a very uh, interesting uh, material. And uh, these uh, peptides, as we've been discovering, are primarily hydrophobic, but we have discovered some that are charged. And uh, uh, presenting yesterday uh, um, was uh, uh, Catherine Gui, who uh, was presenting the work of her um, uh, master's thesis, which she uh, successfully defended uh, just a few months ago. And. Uh, in that, uh, in that presentation, what she's gone on to do is she found out that the cyclone of peptides in flaxseed, uh, you can see they, uh, she's uh, been able to measure the levels in uh, different lines of flaxseed. She's uh, also looked at uh, different flaxseed fractions. She's looked at where these uh, um, uh, peptides are distributed inside the seed and also how they redistribute when you uh, crush the seed and uh, under cold pressing conditions. So where these things would actually end up in, in industrial processing of flaxseed. And also in an effort to, uh, in a part of her research, she's uh, developed methods for making uh, uh, peptide-free flaxseed oil and methods for recovering um, uh, cyclone peptides from flaxseed oil. This uh, slide here gives you an example of her work where she's taken a cold-pressed flaxseed producing a meal and an oil and uh, clarified that oil and studied the, the meal as well and, and uh, tracked the uh, materials through the conventional uh, processing of flaxseed. And uh, what she found uh, was that um, uh, when uh, the uh, laboratory scale uh, processing was conducted, 
uh, there was a higher level of peptides than commercial oil. So there might have been something happening in the commercial oil that was removing a portion of the peptides. Uh, a typical refining step um, of um, adding phosphoric acid also had the, uh, the, the effect of, of totally removing the peptides. And she was able to recover the um, peptides from the phosphoric acid uh, treatment. Also presenting uh, a, a talk yesterday was um, uh, Clara, who's uh, building in this area. She's looking at bioactive compounds in flaxseed. And this is a whole series. So she's looking at the, at the biorefinery and looking at all of the materials in flaxseed. For example, um, the flaxseed is a source of alpha linolenic acid, dietary fiber, cyclopeptides, lignans, car carotenoids. She's looked specifically and talked uh, extensively on the use of um, flaxseed as a source of cyclopeptides and lignan. In this uh, work, uh, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, she looked at uh, um, sequel as isoluresinol diglucoside, um, or SDG, and uh, she's uh, um, done an extensive study of this material as well. She's also uh, scanned the whole world flax collection and uh, was able to uh, look at and discover a totally new compound. Um, this compound uh, has never been observed before, and uh, this is a very unique line that was discovered in, in, in that uh, it was the only um, uh, of the uh, cyclic peptide bearing um, uh, uh, flaxes that uh, was de de um, deficient in both uh, cyclic peptides A and, uh, and C. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a very interesting uh, discover uh, set of discoveries for somebody's uh, thesis to both discover a totally new compound and uh, also uh, discover lines that were deficient in, in specific compounds. And she discovered those by looking at the world collection of, um, of uh, flax cultivars. Um, as, we've, uh, as we go through some of the very important work that's been going on, uh, uh, Mikasa Bagat-Lurie has been working with us trying to improve uh, our understanding of the um, HPLC analysis of cyclone peptides, looking for matrix effects, so that when we actually measure something, when we measure the cyclone peptide level, we know exactly what that level is. And these types of this type of research is very important in the long-term understanding of, of peptides. So uh, we've uh, completed this work and uh, and used the addition method to determine what the uh, what the accuracy that we can measure the. Um, the peptide levels, and so we can show whether uh, these we've accomplished uh, significant uh, increases in peptides or not with our uh, studies. Um, another uh, um, big uh, um, um, effort in our group is uh, is led uh, in part by Peter Gaberneth, and her work uh, she's looked at uh, at all of the uh, mass spectra of, of the peptides, and we've been discovering that there's many peptides that have never been seen before. So. Uh, her work here in this poster uh, shows that um, Peter Gabernet is, uh, is um, uh, identified almost as many peptides uh, and um, as, as have been reported previously, including some that are cyclized from uh, genes here. Then we've also been able to identify the genes for uh, cyclic peptide production. Um, when we move on, uh, we also uh, need uh, and to prepare standards and uh, pure materials to uh, understand the biological activity. In this uh, poster, uh, Vijaya Jadav is uh, showing her uh, work on um, the, uh, the isolation and purification of uh, specific cyclic peptides. And she's uh, been able to um, isolate uh, gram quantities of these so we can use them for... Um, both uh, our own research and for co the research of collaborators. So this is showing the isolation and, and thorough characterization of these uh, molecules. When we uh, work with cyclic peptides, we also need to uh, be able to study uh, the, the uh, versions of these as tagged molecules. Um, uh, the uh, uh, PhD candidate uh, student um, Pramoja Dev is uh, working on methionine chemistry as a, as a mechanism of labeling cyclic peptides. Now, most people who are aware of uh, peptide modification chemistry will have seen the modification of peptides through other groups, typically serine or acidic uh, amino acids, but uh, very few uh, uh, results have ever been reported uh, where methionine modification has been accomplished. And this is because the conditions under which methionine uh, would be 
uh, modified are too harsh for uh, other peptides to withstand. The cyclic peptides are robust enough to withstand uh, uh, this, the rigors of methine modification. So this has been a significant uh, benefit to our research because now we have uh, cyclic peptides that have been modified by putting tethers on them. Um, not only do we look at uh, how to isolate peptides and, and uh, purify them, concentrate them, uh, modify them chemically, we also have to study their use uh, you know, to figure out uh, how they would be used next. And uh, this work here is presented by uh, Aoyuna Sharav. Uh, she, uh, she comes to us from Mongolia. She's looking at flax uh, peptides and their ability to uh, um, act as free radical scra scavengers. We found that the peptides containing um, sulfur in the form of methionine or tryptophan uh, residues are able to act as free radical scavengers. And so uh, Oyuna's work has been very important from that light, but uh, as we look at this poster, and if you look at it closely, you'll see that it gets right down to the mechanism of uh, free radical scavenging. We're actually able, to, uh, in, as shown in her poster, to see the, uh, the products of uh, free radical scavenging. There are actually links between the free radical compound and the peptide through either the methionine group or through the tryptophan group, so we're actually able to, to see novel molecules being produced by the reaction of the free radical and the, uh, and the peptides. In this uh, next poster, which is presented by uh, Dr. Yu Young Shim, she's looking at the binding of cyclone peptides to human serum albumin. Human serum albumin is the uh, protein in the blood that acts as a, tra um, as a trafficking agent for carrying lipids from uh, point to point in the body. So lipids will be uh, picked up by uh, the uh, blood and carried from place to place. And the uh, human serum albumin acts as a, as a, as a, a force for this. What uh, uh, Dr. Shim has uh, accomplished is the, through screening a large number of, uh, of the peptides and looking at their individual binding to the uh, to the human serum album, she's been able to show that very small changes in the um, in the peptides will result in them either being carried with the human serum album um, and and distributed in the human serum album if they were used as a drug, or to be released and and to be in, in solution. And this has been very important for uh, our understanding of the potential use of these as therapeutics. As I'd like to. Uh, you know, conclude, uh, we do have a, a, a large team. Uh, we've had uh, just um, excellent uh, um, success in, in pulling together brilliant individuals. Um, they come from all over the world. Um, and uh, so we've got them from 14 countries, and they're working together, hopefully, to make the world a better place. This is the, uh, the research group, um, a picture taken uh, in January. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea how the uh, team is divided up in protein isolation and stillage biorefinery is uh, uh, um Dr. Shim, uh, and Dr. Wang. In motor oil products is uh, Michelle Nia, um, uh, Katie Yuan, Dr. Shen, and Dr. Wang as well. In terms of flax analysis, uh, biorefinery and uses, uh, we have a very uh, um, uh, significant group here, uh, Bo Gui, Pramod Jadav, uh, Clara Olivia, Oyuna Sharav, Dr. Shem, um, uh, Vijaya Jadav, uh, Dr. Okenyo Owidi, and Dr. Shen, as well as uh, um, Makasa Bargamari. And finally, in biodiesel uh, catalysts, we've had uh, working on that is uh, Felicia Gok and uh, Dr. Shen. And we're uh, fortunate to also have present with us a uh, visiting um, uh, PhD candidate, uh, Michael Okowski. He's uh, from Poland, and he's come uh, to spend his uh, few vacation months to, uh, to work in our laboratory. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much.